point of emphasis as far as my job duties is I handle the technology related and computer crimes, kind of white collar, all the, all the real exciting stuff. Um, and one of the things that I do as part of my job function um, is go around, you know, to the, to the area here and I do presentations and talks with both adults and kids about various topics and one of them is cyberbullying. Um, so this is going to be real informal. Uh, I'm just going to kind of touch on some, <clears throat> just some stories and examples and just some things kind of, uh, a lot of it's kind of covered in the handouts you have there. But uh, as I'm going, please, if you have a question, just shoot your hand up. I'm not, I'm not, doesn't bother me to be interrupted. So, um, and then we'll have time for questions after as well. So um, <clears throat> I guess just in general, um, bullying, I mean, we all know what bullying is when we went to school. I mean, there were bullies in everyone's school. Um, just that nowadays, due to the prevalence of technology and uh, the internet, bullying, well, what we were accustomed to when we were kids, that's still there and that still happens. However, now um, it's kind of taken on a different form. Um, you know, when we were in school, you know, you had the, you know, maybe the, the hallway gauntlet where the seniors would push around the freshmen or stuff them in a locker or maybe just torment kids, um, pick on them for, you know, maybe they're overweight or, you know, there's some, they had some other disability, just reasons that, not good reasons, but reasons that people would bully uh, one another. Um, but now what we find is that, uh, and this isn't just with their kids, but this is what everyone always associates is with children, is that um, when we were kids and we got home, that was kind of like your safe zone. So you don't have to worry about people harassing you at home. I mean, outside of maybe prank phone calls or something like that. But now, because most, a lot of people have smartphones, uh, most, a lot of people have computers, tablets, Video game systems are so many ways that you can connect with people outside of your house without leaving your house. Um, at the same time, uh, those that want to kind of harass or bully people are using those tools or those uh, using that technology to get at people or kids at home. Um, in 2010, 2011, uh, they did a survey. Uh, Nine percent of all kids grades 6 through 12 reported that they had been cyberbullied. In 2013, they did another survey and 15% of high school age kids grades 9 through 12, they say the first one was grades 6 through 12, um, grades 9 through 12 reported being cyberbullied. Now, two things there, uh, the, the, the increase, obviously it's 6% increase over the couple year period. Part of that can be attributed to uh, older kids, so you know maybe there's more of a more access to the internet, but also just that you know as we go, more and more people get connected online, and uh, you know so just a general uptick. Um, <clears throat> just a couple, a few stories. Uh, these are now kind of worst case examples, and certainly not the norm when we're dealing with bullying, and it's possible what can possibly happen from it. But uh, I feel I use these stories uh, in all my presentations because they really kind of drive the point home as to why this is a problem. Um, the first one uh, happened in 2006 to a 14-year-old girl named Megan Meyer. Um, this was national news. You know, you, maybe, you might not remember it, but you probably heard it or saw it at the time. Um, she's a young girl who struggled with depression since third grade. She was overweight and very insecure. Um, so she had, she was, she had gotten psychiatric treatment kind of throughout growing up just because she has had these problems with herself. Um, she started this at the time, this obviously 2006 was a little bit older, but she, uh, that's what we're talking about MySpace here, which doesn't get used much now. It's Facebook. And it was the more popular, but she started a MySpace page. And shortly after that, a boy uh, named uh, Josh Evans 
messaged her and just kind of struck up a conversation or whatever with you. And they started exchanging messages back and forth and uh, became friends. You know, and her mom said she thought he was really cute and, it, you know, kind of, kind of had a relationship, if you will, even though they'd never met. Um, one day, actually October 16th, 2006, the tone of his messages kind of did a 180 and started with uh, just kind of saying things like, uh, you know, I'm finding out more about you. I hear you're not nice to your friends. I don't know if I want to be friends with you anymore. And just kind of started taking shots at her that way. And, you know, they, they exchanged messages back and forth. Um, the last message Josh sent Megan said, everybody in O'Fallon knows who you are. You are a bad person and everybody hates you. Have a rest of your life and the world will be a better place without you. She sent him a message back that said, you're the kind of a boy, or, you're the kind of boy a girl would kill herself for. 20 minutes later, her mom walked into her bedroom and found her hanging in her closet. A um, Couple of weeks later, uh, a local parent um, one of the, that knew the Meyer family talked to Megan's mom and said, hey, uh, just want to let you know this, uh, what the heck, what's her name? Um, Lori Drew, who was a friend of the Meyer family. They, they had holidayed together. They lived four houses down from another. Just to let you know that, that Josh Evans doesn't exist. That was someone that Lori Drew made up. Well, it comes, turns out that Megan and Lori's, Drew's daughter, Sarah, had been friends, and they had a disagreement. You know, Megan apparently must have said something about Sarah, and as often happens with kids that age, they hated each other now. They're not friends anymore. I mean, it's, it's a common thing, you know. But apparently Sarah's mother was so offended and angered by this that she wanted to teach Megan a message. So she, uh, an 18-year-old coworker or employee of hers, and a few other girls that were friends of Sarah started this account with Basically, they said they just wanted to get information on Megan to embarrass her. Um, obviously, the last comment there that was said to her, you know, that you know, they, they said that that was just to try to end the relationship. And unfortunately, it led to the ending of Megan's life. Uh, Lori was actually a year later, she was arrested and charged federally, convicted. Um, the conviction was overturned, but out of that, they did come up with call, what's called Megan's Law, and just passed some, basically some laws to help give parents and law enforcement whoever tools to actually do something about cyberbullying. Because prior to this, in a lot of states, really wasn't a lot to do. It was, you know, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. you know, but most states now have those laws on the books. Um, second, exam, second story. Um, she was, I think, 17 or 18. I can't, she was 18 at the end, but her name was Jesse Logan. Um, and this, this started out of a relationship she had. She had a boyfriend. And there's, I don't know for sure if she sent, she sent him photos or there's been some claims that maybe he, some, he got them from her phone. But nonetheless, she had naked photos of herself on her phone. He got them likely probably because she sent them to him. He shared them with some girls in their school and those photos spread like wildfire. And these kids started you know, harassing Jesse, calling her slut, calling her names, and really just tormenting her. And it got you know, to the point where um, you know, Jesse, she didn't want to go to school, so she's, you know, her mom didn't really know anything was going on until the school called and said, Jesse's not going to school. So she started, took away her car, took away her phone, started taking her to school and dropping her off. She would just go into school and then skip later. Um, and this, this kind of just went on because she hated being at school so much because all the kids were tormenting her. Um, this got to the point where she actually changed schools. Uh, but kids figured out where she went to school and then they sent the messages, the pictures to the kids at the new school and basically got them to target her too. Um, 
she actually went on the news, and it was an anonymous story, but just kind of talking about the dangers, we call it sexting, and this is something else we talk about with the kids. Um, but she went on and just kind of do a story, just kind of like a, a public service type story, just to tell people, hey, don't send pictures of yourself because this is what happened to me and I don't want it to happen to anyone else. Um, Two months later, she was actually she attended a funeral of a classmate who had committed suicide for something I, I don't know what it was exactly, but for whatever reason that kind of tripped something with her where she saw that as a way out and she came home and she killed herself as well. Um, but again, I mean the, 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 you know the example there of being I mean she went as far as to move to a different city to get away from this and still couldn't because. Oh, she lives in, she moved to Marshfield. I know so-and-so Marshfield. Man, send the message and just like that. It, you know, I mean, where 30 years ago, if you had moved, that probably would have pretty well ended it, you know, because no one, you know, no one would have known. But now people are so close. I mean, I, you know, I talk to people online uh, all the time from not this country. I mean, just, you know, we can talk with people instantly from other countries now. and. Um, that kind of comes into play. Um, the last example is actually local. Uh, this was a case that I handled. Uh, a young woman, her family, they're from Mosinee, and they contacted, contacted our department. Um, their local police department wasn't real interested in helping them, um, so they called and asked us if we could help because their problem originated with someone who lived in Wood County. So. She was engaged to a person living, to a guy who lived in this county, and over the course of their engagement, they lived together. Um, she was, I think she was 19, somewhere. She was, you know, she was an adult, but she was quite still young, and he was a little bit older than her. Um, over the course of the relationship, uh, you know, he had taken some photos of her, some explicit photos of her. The relationship ended, and she ended it and moved back home. A short time later, um, she's finding that she can't get in access to any of her like email or eBay or PayPal, basically any of her online accounts. She can't access any of them anymore because the passwords have changed. Then all of a sudden, all of her friends, her email contacts, including family members, get an email from her email address basically saying, hey, check out this link. And when they click on it, what they found was that her ex had taken these photos of her and posted them on a website called myex.com or something like that. Basically, this website is set up for people to post revenge pictures, if you will, of their ex-girlfriend or boyfriend. Usually they're explicit, and as they were in this case. He posted the photos of her, her name, her address, her phone number, and everything. That was, that was one of the other things that first tipped her off there was a problem because she started getting text messages from weird people, some rather crude text messages like, you know, hey, you're really hot, I'd really like to have sex with you, but that's a cleaned up version of what she was getting. They were a lot more vulgar than that. Um, so she, you know, obviously, understandably, was very distraught over this, that now there's weirdos from everywhere that, not only know what she looks like nude, but are now contacting her and messaging her and God knows what else. So, um, you know, she reported to us at that point because she tried to get the website to take the pictures down, which they'll do for, I think they charge 500 bucks to remove it. Um, website, the servers are located I think in Sweden, so, they're, they're, that, those pictures are still on there. I could never get because they don't have to. They don't have to do anything. You know, they're not in the United States, so we have no recourse other than to ask nicely, and they just ignored me. Um, bigger problem is is that just to make sure that these photos, you know, even if she would have got the ones taken down, he just kept. They just kept getting reposted, so they were. You know, not only would you have to pay five hundred dollars to get them taken down, but now there's three different. You know, and you just change the name a little bit, so they're posted. You know, with different names. So basically, made it. You know, she is. She was didn't have the means to afford this anyway, like most of us wouldn't. Um, 
basically made it so she couldn't have these removed. Uh, so she reported that to us. Um, you know, I was able I was able to recover all of the, all of her accounts or get them shut down. And uh, you know, I actually did serve a search warrant on his house, arrested him, charged him with stalking, among other things, and he was convicted of all of that. Um, that one was, I mean, because this this family, I dealt primarily with on the phone because they're from Mozanie, and the first time I actually. I actually met them was uh, at one of the hearings after I arrested the offender, and her mom, her mom and dad came and talked to me in the hallway and just, you know, they thanked me because they said that at the point at which they called our department, um, she had been running into dead ends with websites and uh, with the, her local agency, and they actually had to have her committed because she was going to attempt suicide. Um, thankfully, she was, this was enough resolute closure or resolution, whatever you want to say for her that, you know, that isn't, that isn't the problem and they were very grateful for that as am I. But, um, you know, it's just, it's just people, when, these get in, when they get in these situations, they feel like, hopeless and you know there's no there's no way from there's like no way out or no way for me to fix this i just can't deal with it anymore and sometimes most of the time again this these are these are kind of extreme examples but sometimes they look for a kind of a final solution because they just can't deal with it <clears throat> um now basically, um, especially for those of you that are parents, um, and, and it does again, this doesn't just have to be with children, but um, just some things uh, you can do, I guess, you know, with your kids. And I realize some of this stuff gets harder the older the kids get because they want to be independent. Um, but that's also why it's good to start early. Um, but basically, first thing would be, it's kind of like, you know, if your kids are going somewhere, if they're going, they're leaving the house and not just playing in the air, but they're going somewhere, you're going to say, well, where are you going? Who are you going with? When are you going to be home? You, same kind of rules apply, should apply online. You know, what, what do you, what, what websites do you, what, what, where, where are they going? What websites are they going to? Who are you friends with or who are you talking to on there? Um, you know, basically, best thing you can do there is just be a parent and be nosy, you know, and hopefully you have a relationship with the children that they're, you know, receptive to that. Um, but basically you just, you just ask the same questions that you would if they were leaving the house because, you know, they're, they can be exposed to the same, same or worse things online that they can, you know, downtown. So, um, Depending again, depending on the person, depending on the child, um, you, it may be something that you want. You may want, maybe you want to monitor, you know, monitor their online activity, whether that's just kind of checking on, check their web history or whatever. Um, there's also software, if you so choose, that you can install on your computers or on the mobile devices that will that will monitor it for you. Um, you know, again, every situation is different, so it just depends on what you feel is necessary. Um, the other thing is familiarize yourself, and I realize this isn't always the easiest because some people, you know, I do I do computer crimes and uh, as a job, but my knowledge of the websites and some of the devices nowadays. I, pale in comparison to probably your average 12 year old. Um, so the best thing, best advice is, you know, you're not, I don't anticipate that you're all gonna be able to master all the websites and apps and everything, whatever it is the kids are using, but at least be familiar with them. Um, you know, because there are some, there are some websites or some apps that, you know, probably aren't the best and you probably don't want, you know, you wanna be careful with, um, your child having exposure to them. Um, one, you know, one we run into a lot, and the kids are real popular with kids, or at least it has been. They probably, again, it's so hard to keep up because they probably moved on to another one by now, but uh, it's called Kick Messenger. Uh, we run into a lot of problems with that because 
kids love to use it because you can, it's easy to meet people, you know, social networking, that's the whole point of social networking. But not only do kids like it, pedophiles love it. And we get call cases like that all the time where, you know, Joe Pervert from wherever is convincing or talking and they're sending, you know, some, it, it just ranges. Sometimes it's talking to them explicitly, trying to get them to send pictures. Sometimes they just skip the middleman and start sending pictures of themselves. And I don't mean face shots, um, but it, these, some of these applications and whatnot are they're pedophiles' dreams, basically. So just be aware of what it is your kids are doing and what they're using, uh, just so you're at least aware of the potential dangers. Um, and the big thing to stress to them is that if they are being bullied or if they are being you know, targeted by someone like a pedophile or whatever you want to say. Make sure they know that it is okay to come to you, that it is safe, that you're not just going to flip out and take away their computer and phone and everything to protect them from the big bad internet. Because that's a lot of them, they're not, I'm not going to tell my mom and dad because they're just going to take my phone away. You know, and they look at it like they're not doing, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm, I'm, but I don't want to take a chance of that happening. So just make sure they know that it, they're safe, you know, safe in that regard and that you will actually help them and not essentially punish them. Um, but that's, you know, where clear rules within your household about the use of the internet and technology is, uh, you know, it's important to have. Um, just kind of, Educate them, I guess, about what what should what is okay to for them to do or share or say online. Uh, you know, I mean, once whatever it is you post, whether it's a mean comment to someone else or what have whatever, no matter what it is, once you post it, it's out there, and you know, it, it can be out there. It very likely is going to be out there forever. So. Um, you know, making them aware of, you know, the, the, their, their actions online have consequences that way and that, you know, the things that they say to people, it can not only, you know, hurt them or embarrass them, but it could do the same come back on them. Um, privacy settings also, um, you'd be amazed at how many people online use social media and share their entire lives, but don't have any privacy settings as far as any sort of restrictions as to who can see it. And, you know, again, this is the kind of stuff where someone that maybe, you know, someone you don't get along with, a bully or whatever, um, you know, if they can get access to your profile, they can, they use this stuff to make, you know, because one of the common things we see now, um, you know, they'll take a picture of someone that they, you know, farmed off Facebook or whatever, and then doctor it, and then they use that to, you know, kind of embarrass or harass or whatever. Um, and a big one, and this is kind of this. I should have said in the, that last example, the local story, the reason, the way he was able to get all of her accounts is because when they were together, she, he knew all her passwords. So he didn't hack it or anything, he just, he knew her password, so he went in and changed the password and then changed the recovery options so she couldn't recover it, and bam. But that's, again, same thing with your kids, you know, uh, you know don't share passwords. So that's common, they, they, they do it, and then you end up, they end up in a fight because that's what happens, and then next thing you know, you're having stuff said or you're, you're saying stuff about people because they know how to get into your account. Um, I guess the big thing is if, if, if you're being bullied, the first, the first rule is so hard to do. It is really, I understand that, but is don't respond. That's exactly what, that's what they, they're looking for. They want the reaction. Um, you know, when someone's saying something to someone for no reason other than to be mean or spiteful, what they want is they want you to turn around and say, screw you, because now they know it's bothering them. I'm winning. Don't respond. 
save whatever it is, whether if you're on Facebook, you know, save the post. Um, if you know if it's a text message, save the text, whatever, but just save it um, basically as evidence. You know, if it's on if it's on a social media site, report them because it's that kind of behavior is usually a violation of their terms of service. So report them to the website. They'll have, you know get their account deactivated generally. Um, and if you're able, depending on again the media they're using, block them so they can't send further messages because. You know, unless you yourself also enjoy the, you know, bickering back and forth, most people don't want to hear it. So if you block them, they can't get to you. You don't have to listen to it anymore. Then, you know, again, report them to whatever website it is that they're using. If if it's if it's bad enough, I mean, if you're talking, you know, I mean, if it's like, you know, threats of violence or explicit photos. Um, or you know maybe you know we've seen stuff like this. I'm working on a case right now with this where the person is taking pictures of their house, or maybe taking you know, someone's taking pictures of you somewhere where you would expect privacy. Um, you know that's at that point you're probably getting to the time in which you might need to call law enforcement. And I understand most people most people you know why don't you report it? Oh, I didn't want to waste your time. And then that's furthest thing from the truth you know that that's not a waste of our time that's why we're here um, so don't feel like you can't report it because you can and I you know and some people don't want to do it because they're embarrassed and then we understand that um, but uh, unfortunately all too often the stuff doesn't end until we get involved and sometimes you know there's times that doesn't even do it you know I mean just um, usually we can end stuff like this even, you know, depending on the offense with a phone call or go and talk to the person and then does not always. Some people are really committed to it, like the one I'm dealing with now. And, you know, he's he's probably not going to quit until I can put him in handcuffs, you know, but that's the thing. He's not going to quit. So if it gets to that point, um, by all means, call us and we'll you know, do our best to help. So I guess you've got a bunch, there's a bunch of handouts in the back table if you didn't get any. Um, there's all kinds of different information on there. Um, there are also a lot of resources online. Um, you know, I think stopbullying.gov is one website with a bunch, but there's a lot of websites. Uh, Megan Meyer, actually her mom has started a foundation um, focused where she travels around the country giving speeches basically talking about cyberbullying. They have a nice website with all kinds of information and uh, you know stuff if, you know if you wanted to look at it. So I guess that's kind of the basic overview. Um, so if there's questions, I'm more than happy to sit and answer them. What is the average age of someone being bullied? I mean, you, you hear it you know, a lot in schools, but I hear there's you know, workplace bullying. But what is the average age that you hear about? I, don't, I guess I don't really know that exact answer, but it, your comment is 100% correct. Um, everyone first associates bullying with kids, but um, it's far from just kids. We deal, you know, we deal with this kind of thing with adults quite frequently as well, um, whether it be in the workplace or just in general. I mean, kids, kids don't handle relationships breaking up very well, but I might argue that adults handle it worse. So. Um, we very often see that kind of thing when, when two adults end a relationship that that turns into bullying, harassment, stalking. You know, they're all you know. I call we call this cyberbullying, but all too often it's kind of like a it, they kind of blur together. Um, you know, bullying can turn into stalking very quickly, um, and you know, stalking can turn into something worse pretty easily too. So, and that's why it's best to kind of stop it when it's bullying because, you know, so not, again, when this, these are, it's not the common outcome, but it's the possible outcome. And I guess I'm not personally, wouldn't be willing to just sit back and 
uh, it won't be that bad. You know, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not. I don't like to gamble like that. So, sorry, I don't have the exact answer. But. I might have missed this, but how many charges actually come out of like if you do an investigation and you talk to families and say no, we can't go any further because it's more bullying than actual criminal charges? Or? It depends. Mostly, usually, like the bullying kind of stuff, rarely, it, it usually doesn't end in charges. Um, you talk to them. Absolutely. That's, we don't, yeah, we don't arrest if we don't have to because it's not, that's not, you know, but sometimes some people need it. I mean, they, every situation is so unique and that's, um, you know, one of the things I like about my job is that I might go on, like when I was on patrol, I might go on 10 disorderly complaints, but every one of them was completely different. They're all disorderly complaints. So if you're just reading the paper, oh, there was a, they were busy, you know, that must be boring. Well, no, because they're all, they're all dynamic. They're all different. Every one of them ends in a different way. And generally the person you're dealing with, they'll kind of tell you, you know, how they, with uh, not directly, but their their responses and their behavior will tell you what the appropriate solution is. Um, most people, like I guess, and most people, a simple phone call is usually enough. Um, if it you know depends if we have you know if we can find them. If it needs to be a face to face, that that almost always works. But again, it also depends on what's being done because if what they've done to involve us in the first place was bad enough, we're not, you know, maybe the, the victim isn't just happy with, you know, talking to them because we try to honor the victim's wishes as well. I mean, it could be pretty bad where you might look at it and say, I want them in the slammer, but maybe your tolerance is a little less and you're just like, I just want it to end. I don't, you know, could you just make them quit? I don't want them arrested. But there's enough to put them in the slammer. It, it, so it's just, it's really every situation is so dynamic. It, it first and foremost starts with what the victim, what the victim wants and what the victim needs. Um, depending, again, it depends. But, you know, if it's bad enough, there, you know, but now you're getting into some pretty, pretty healthy violations where the victim wouldn't even have a say so. But generally, uh, if, you know, if you want, if it's to the point where you're having to call us, at a minimum, we have some form of disorderly conduct where we could write a ticket or, you know, make a misdemeanor arrest. I mean, is the threshold for that's pretty low. All it has to do is someone has to do something essentially to cause a disturbance. And if they've done something to you, you know, legitimately done something to you and to which you've called us, that's, they've, they've caused a disturbance. So we almost always have that level. And then it goes from there. I mean, you have harassment, you have stalking. Um, those are the two common ones. Um, depending on what they're using, we have uh, a misuse of a communications device or misuse of a computerized device. So we have a bunch of different tools, it just depends, but um, it just, it starts first and foremost with what you would want, and then from there, kind of what the offender, how they, how they react, I guess. Anybody up? I've had some interesting conversations with schools recently. Um, and, and something that they brought up that I guess I never even thought about, but they were talking about defining bullying because they're having issues that technically aren't bullying, but they're being called bullying. What's your definition of bullying or cyberbullying? I wish I would have brought it down normally. If I have my normal presentation, I actually have a slide that has has that exactly. Um, something along the lines of any behavior that would um, like threaten, harass, intimidate, um, insult, or, you know, or cause another person to feel any of these things. Uh, so it's pretty broad. Um, but as with anything, it kind of, you know, you think you have it defined and then something new pops up. So um, I guess what example, do you have any examples of things that 
they thought weren't bullying or something? You know, like what? No, um, I don't know if I have any examples. Or any? Does it have to be repeated? No, that no. I mean, the thing with repeated is that that's a common theme in statutes. You know, as far as criminal wise, like for stalking, there has to be repeated acts, or I think harassment requires repeated acts. Um, so maybe now they're trying to kind of expand that, you know, where if I just was walking down the hall one day and said, I think you're fat and ugly, and then that was that, well now, okay, was, was it right? Absolutely not. Was it bullying? Well, I can see where now they're trying to say, well, was it bullying? Because that was just a one-time thing, or, but, you know, to me, I mean, it, did it need to be said? No. Was it appropriate? No. What was the purpose in saying it? To hurt them. That's to me. That's bullying. But again, it goes now. It goes back to like what you asked. What What do we need to do to? What's the proper outcome now? What's the proper solution? You know. So, generally, at least some sort of counseling, I guess, or you know, talking to them. I guess, you know, but. Definitions change. They always, you know, it's always kind of like an ever evolving thing, and so it's hard to pin that down because every time you do, you know, so I should have brought that. <laughs> There's one thing I didn't think of, I should have printed that off and brought it, so I'm sorry. I haven't done a bullying presentation in a while, so to try to remember it, it was kind of rusty. Well, I think it's kind of nice to hear that or reassuring that a lot of times it's just a matter of a contact mm -hmm. to somebody and it, it quits, hopefully. And yeah. That's, that's kind of nice to... I wouldn't even say a lot of times, I would say most times. Yeah. I mean, the times where it goes beyond that are, are generally rare. Like I said, my examples are the exception to the rule. Most of the time, because most people, when someone knocks on your door or calls you from police department or sheriff's department, most people's reaction is, oh. <laughs> yeah. Not everyone, I mean, again, there are always exceptions to everything, but so that's why normally it's enough because who wants to be, who wants to be talking to me? Who wants the neighbors looking because there's a squad car parked in your yard? Or if it's a kid whose parents want the cops there talking to their kid, you know, and that's another thing a lot of times we see is, I mean, I've actually done that um, with incidents where I've dealt with the kid and I've foregone any sort of law enforcement action after talking to the parents because I know if I was that kid, I would not want to go home because there is going to be hell to pay from mom or dad. So that right there is like, you know, I don't need to do anything because I believe you've got it handled when we get home, you know. We're just looking, we, we don't care how we get to the dire, desired solution, we just want to get there. And that isn't always, you know, tickets or arrests or whatever. There's, ideally, we can handle this. Ideally, the schools can handle it. Ideally, the parents can handle it. We don't want to get involved. We get involved when we have to, when you can't solve it. So, and we can't always either, but oftentimes we have tools available to us to to do things that you can't do. But, so. Do you have an idea of how many calls the department gets for this type of thing in a given period of time? No, it's so hard to track because it's kind of this kind of same thing. We tried to do this. I did an identity theft presentation a couple months ago for one of the lunch and learns and to try it because the, when the calls come in, they can be entered in so many different ways. And plus we have uh, like how many, eight, eight, how many law enforcement agencies in the county. So to try to actually track that is so hard because you have, it could come in as a disturbance, it could come in as a computer crime, it could come in as a um, family dispute, it could come, you know, I mean, there's, so there's really no way to put a number to it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's common enough, let's put it that way, I guess, where, um, it is not at all unusual for me to read, we do. We call it the blotter. Every day we read the blotter to see what's happened in the last period of, so just we have an idea of what's going on in the county. 
it is not uncommon for me to read the blotter in the morning and see the words Facebook because someone's harassing somebody on Facebook or bullying or harassing bullying or whatever. So it is common enough. So. Anyone else? Is Facebook the one that you see the most of, or is it more like the apps? And uh, Facebook, just because there are so many people on Facebook. I mean, it's easily the most heavily used social networking website in the world. So um, just by volume, that's the one we see the most. Anybody else? Okay, well, hopefully I didn't yep. put anyone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.